Okay, uh, welcome to uh, a little chat about uh, inertia, an inertial collection of particles, mainly relevant to um, the question number six on chapter 14, Fundamentals of Particle Technology, which is about uh, gas cyclone design. But let's talk about inertia first. Uh, what we have here is a, um, a target which could typically be a fibre, um, and we have dust just here, a particle of dust approaching the target. And there's the particle just there. And it's approaching the target on a gas streamline. So it's caught in a gas streamline. Uh, and here is the uh, just the center of the uh, R equals naught. So uh, anyway, the particle will approach in the gas streamline. Now the gas has got to change direction to move round the obstruction. The particle though has significantly higher inertia than the gas and it can't change direction so easily. It will move slightly because it's caught in the gas stream but it won't follow the gas stream so inertially it separates from that streamline and could possibly uh, hit the target. Uh, when it hits the target we have two potential outcomes. One is it could just stick to the target. The other is if it has sufficient momentum uh, it could bounce, bounce off the target. Uh, particles, small particles especially, uh, with ele electrostatic charges quite often like to stick to things. So uh, sticking to the target is a good way of filtering out particles uh, for various applications. But this is the, the process of inertia. Uh, this just here is the process of inertia. The gas can move easily. The particles have inertia and don't move easily and eventually hit whatever the target is that's taking the particles. OK, well, that's inertia on an external surface. In a gas cyclone, we're talking about inertia on an internal surface, but it's still inertia that's important. What we have here is a, uh, a plan view and uh, a side elevation of uh, a gas cyclone. Uh, so here is the feed going in to a gas cyclone and it goes in at a velocity of, well, we'll be calling that UG, velocity of the gas. So here is the gas going into the gas cyclone and just as we had before, there's particles trapped on that streamline or following that streamline and the gas changes direction rapidly. Uh, as the gas changes direction rapidly the particles carry on because of their inertia and hit the wall of the, the cyclone. Okay, once they've hit the wall of the cyclone, if we come down to the uh, picture below, once they've hit the wall of the cyclone these particles will then progress downwards they might become re-entrained in the gas flow inside the cyclone, but if they do, so what? They'll just come out again because of the inertia, because the gas is continually turning round and round. The particles will again uh, come out and will work their way down the cyclone. In fact, if you have ever see a glass cyclone uh, in operation, you can see the particles swirling downwards so they are moving uh, around the cyclone as well as downwards and eventually they'll find their way into the dust hopper at the bottom of the cyclone which of course we have to periodically empty okay so a gas cyclone doesn't have an underflow like a hydrocyclone does uh, but it does still have an overflow because the gas comes into the gas cyclone changes direction, swirls around and easily leaves the uh, top of the gas cyclone just there in a sort of overflow past the vortex finder and in, into the overflow and then away from the system. OK, so here we're collecting the particles on the inner surface rather than the outer surface of the fibre previously, but it is still uh, inertia that is actually the main reason for 
the collection of the particles. So it is an, it's an inertial collection process. It is not centrifugal force. Centrifugal force we can use to explain how a hydrocyclone works, but not, uh, but not a gas cyclone. A gas cyclone is inertial collection of the uh, particles because simply the particles don't follow the gas stream as illustrated on this top diagram just there. So, okay, how do we characterise this inertia? Well, we characterise it with this thing called the Stokes number. So what we have over here is the Stokes number, Stokes, and it is dimensionless. It is not uh, Stokes is settling or anything like that. It is the Stokes number. It's a dimensionless number, STK. Uh, and interestingly, it's a combination of parameters that are both relevant to the particles, the fluid that, suspended, that suspends the particles, and the system that uh, the particles and fluid are in. Let's go through the, uh, the equation here. X is the particle diameter, so that's a particle property. So if I say P for particle property, so that's P for particle property. The larger the particles, the greater the Stokes number. The velocity of the gas, okay, that's a fluid parameter. The higher the fluid velocity, the higher the Stokes number. Density of the particles, that's back to a particle property. So uh, that's, again, so that X and rho S, density and particle size are particle properties. Okay, and then of course down here we've got the viscosity of the gas, which again is fluid. So the fluid has the velocity of the fluid and the viscosity, whereas the system is the characteristic linear dimension. I'll call that uh, an S term there. The system uh, is a characteristic linear dimension, would be the fiber radius in our first example, but here our system is a cyclone. So what causes the gas to move around inside a cyclone? Uh, well, it's the size of the cyclone and the characteristic linear dimension we use is the internal diameter of that cyclone. Okay, so the smaller the diameter, the larger the Stokes number. Okay, so what's the relevance of the Stokes number? Well, it's this relation that we see down here is the important re relevance of the Stokes number. Great efficiency is collection efficiency. So great efficiency equals collection efficiency. So this is collection efficiency of uh, dust particles. And it might go up to something like 100%. It's deliberately not uh, necessarily put in there. It doesn't really matter where it goes up to. But the great efficiency is this uh, unique relation between Stokes number and collection efficiency if we have inertial collection. Okay, so if we have inertial collection, and there are other means of dust collection, but if it's inertial collection, we have this unique relationship between the Stokes number and the collection or grade efficiency. So provided your system has a Stokes number of that value, you will have that amount of collection efficiency of the dust. Okay, well, how might this be useful? Supposing we do uh, some laboratory tests with a small laboratory gas cyclone. Uh, in this particular question, it's called an 8-inch cyclone. That's the diameter in the laboratory. And we develop this correlation between grade efficiency and Stokes number then we can use that to predict the performance, rather weird shaped industrial cyclone, uh, but we can do, use that 
same correlation to predict the performance of the much larger industrial cyclone, which I think in the question is something like five feet in diameter rather than the eight inch diameter. So you get the same collection efficiency, the same unique relation between Stokes number uh, in this device and this device, so long as they're geometrically similar, ratio of uh, diameters, feed inlets and things like that. And that's a useful technique because obviously it's a technique we can use to scale up or predict the performance of a design when, when things change. I think it's fairly obvious that you could predict grade efficiency or correlate grade efficiency with particle diameter along the x-axis here. Okay, But this is one step beyond that because particle diameter is one component of Stokes number, very important component of Stokes number, but this takes into account everything else that's in the Stokes number. All these other terms. And you can clearly see that as particle diameter goes up, that's the x, x squared term, so as x goes up, Stokes number will also go up. In other words, the inertia of the particles goes up. That's quite logical. The interesting thing here is the system what we can do with the system because system is on on the, the diameter here is on the bottom so if we make the diameter smaller okay the diameter of the cyclone smaller then the stokes number goes up and in fact the particle collection efficiency will also go up because that's what we saw with the curve below and that is exactly how or why dyson uh, with his gas cyclones and the um, vacuum cleaner that he developed originally, which had a certain diameter on his vacuum cleaner of that sort of scale, was then changed to several cyclones that are much smaller at that sort of scale. So if this is Dyson Mark 1, Dyson Vacuum Cleaner Mark 2 was at a much smaller scale precisely because of this D parameter just there, the diameter. Uh, making that diameter smaller makes the Stokes number go, go higher and therefore the dust collection is going to be uh, higher without changing anything else. Uh, so removal of dust from the domestic environment, you could get a better efficiency by having the multitude of these smaller diameter cyclones rather than the larger diameter cyclones. So the Stokes number is a, a very useful correlation for both design, uh, understanding how a process works and giving you an insight into how to improve a process if you have the option to do things like change the particle size, change the gas velocity, change the solids density, change the viscosity of the fluid or simply to just change the diameter of the cyclone. Small is better, but obviously it comes at a penalty, and that penalty is uh, a higher energy, a uh, higher pressure drop. Okay, so that's the basis of the starting point for answering question six. The idea that we can use the data obtained from the small laboratory cyclone, which I believe is an 8 inch diameter cyclone, and predict the performance of the 5 feet diameter cyclone, which is the industrial. That's what we're going to do in question 6. Okay, thank you.